Please keep your seat. We are starting next session now. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon and uh, welcome back. Well, I will begin by thanking the organizers for the uh, wonderful environment post-COVID. I call it post-COVID even though we're still in the midst of the pandemic, but hopefully we've passed the peak. And for the privilege of being here, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for those who are staying and engaging with this panel. The panel is about across the Strait of Hormuz towards a new regional cooperation architecture. Um, I'm delighted to have a distinguished guest, um, Mr. Ahmed Abu Ghaid, who is the Secretary General of the Arab League or League of Arab States. We have virtually uh, with us, uh, Mr. Rafael Mariano Grossi, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. With this topic being focused on the Gulf region, uh, the organizers tried and aimed at having three policymakers at the top level with us. And uh, unfortunately, all three um, apologized. And the, as you can see from the program, Mr. Naive al Hajraf will not be with us, uh, which will create a little bit of a gap in terms of the Gulf, but actually no gap in terms of the overall picture that we want to address. Uh, and that is really dealing with the architecture across the region, across the Gulf, as well as the Middle East uh, as a whole. And we all know from the debates that we've heard today uh, and um, the topics of the day is that Everybody's focused on the global power priorities in the region or the Biden administration's priority in the region. And everything comes back to one major issue and that is the nuclear deal, JCPOA. Everybody's concerned how that is progressing, but importantly, people see the bigger picture. There are more to the Middle East uh, than, than just one issue. The Middle East is rich, is complex, multi-layered, has many lines of conflicts as well as uh, alignments and uh, a very fascinating change in its uh, current alignments and architecture that uh, may well be a good driver uh, for evolution in the future. So there are issues to be discussed uh, with, the, with the speakers who are in a very good position, uh, who are in the, uh, two, uh, leading two very unique organizations uh, both of which uh, multi-member states 
not enviable tasks. Uh, sometimes looks like herding cats in that there are, the member states are not always on the same page. But in the last year or two, or at least few years, there have been major developments which we uh, try to focus on. Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Abulghait um, to really uh, to set the scene. Um, the region, the Middle East, the peninsula that we're looking at, uh, while having internal issues and problems, the, the evolution of power dynamics uh, has been such that there are regional powers um, engaged in rivalries, engaged in conflicts via direct interventions or via proxies or via undermining states or making use of states apparatus, cross-border problems, uh, while there is absolute need for them to engage, negotiate and find a new way forward in terms of Middle East order and so on. And everyone in the region, while they are engaging internally as well as regionally, they are very much uh, um, in line or engaged with uh, the global powers, uh, especially United States, Russia, uh, and China. So there could be ways of doing a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths that these people bring to the world? What are the weaknesses they are suffering from? What are the threats and what are the opportunities? So I'm going to ask you, uh, Mr. Tabulet, to give us the picture because you are um, in a very good position to really tell us with, um, in a very objective way with your bird's eye view of the, the challenges that the Gulf as well as the entire peninsula and Middle East are facing, what is focusing their mind in terms of external threats uh, and challenges and where we are heading. And I'm going to then uh, ask you to end with the issue of JCPOA because this will then lead me to the next speaker. Please go ahead. How long am I uh, allowed I think, to speak? I think if you uh, speak Dr. five minutes, I'll, get, no, I'll no, give you several us, five let minutes. Let seven, us seven minutes to I'll start give you the first with. seven minutes, and there okay. are quite a few five minutes until we've finished. You see, we both come from the Middle East, and we have the bazaar mentality. I will uh, start by seven minutes, then I will extend them by uh, another two to three. Yeah. However, thank you very much, Dr. Delauer, for uh, uh, chairing this uh, panel. When I received the invitation to speak on that specific subject across uh, the Hormuz and structure, uh, future structure for cooperation, I felt it was too narrow. It was too narrow. And you widened the scope when you spoke about the Middle East. What I intend to, to say is that there are two straits that are crucial, the uh, Hormuz and the Babel Mandab. The Arab world or Arab countries have the privilege of overlooking three important, uh, three important straits, Gibraltar, Babel Mandab, Hormuz, as well as a very important vital uh, passage, sea passage, the Suez Canal, to bring energy and to bring trade across the world. Now, two of them are full of tensions right now. We take Hormuz. Hormuz, 2019, uh, Saudi oil facilities are bombed. Tankers and the territorial waters of the Emirates are bombed. That resembles what I have seen personally myself when I was serving in the United Nations in, 80, in the 80s, the tanker war. Now, there is tension. Why there is tension? Because we have two issues that are tormenting that region, the Gulf. The Iranian uh, nuclear file, and allow me to speak a little bit on it later, and the behavior of the Iranian state across the region aiming at reaching and building influence in the Mediterranean. 
the coastal line eastern Mediterranean. That is one aspect of the issue. The second aspect, as I said, Babel Mandab. And there also you see the accusations against Iran interfering in uh, Yemen, building up tensions there to the point that, again, tankers are being attacked, mined, or torpedoed in the Red Sea. And again, it reminds me of what I have seen in the 90s when there were lots of mines, mines scattered all over the Red Sea at the time in the 90s. Nobody knew how did it emerge. And then the accusation emerged that again it was the Iranian uh, revolution that was spreading the mines in that area. So you have two uh, points of tension. Parallel to that, you have a very rich, as you said, a very rich region of oil and gas. And the world, I attended today, this morning, a session, and the speaker says, the oil, the riches of the oil. So there is a kind of a rivalry, a competition building up, if not permanent all over the all over the last, or over the last 40 years or so, even 50 years. The Iranians are making offers, proposals, talking about projects for uh, collective security, for uh, an area of cooperation and peace, but established through discussions amongst states of the region, if not of Gulf. That is, in a certain way, building up for the hegemony of Iran over that region. And many countries are rejecting it from within the region. <laughs> Parallel to that, again, a country like Russia is making, again, collective security offers, proposals to bring security to and cooperation to the, the, the Gulf. That said, it is rejected by the other side, Western powers, uh, the United States. Why is this happening? It is happening, I think, because of the Iranian file, the Iranian file. I personally was amongst those who have been in support of JCPOA at the time in 2015, because I felt it was, in a way, delaying Iran reaching the threshold of, of being a nuclear military power. We have to succeed in reaching uh, a point whereby the Iranians, the Americans, and the P5 reaching a new agreement or activating the old agreement. Why is it so? Because introducing nuclear military, a, a new nuclear military power to the region will trigger a race, a race that I'm sure Arab countries will be eager to create a balance. Okay, I'm going to... Um, Wait a moment, please, I think one I've got moment. 30 seconds. If we <laughs> are to tackle the Iranian, we have also not to miss the fact that we have an already nuclear military power in the region symbolized in Israel. So the Israelis will be asked, pushed to abide by the MPT and to disarm. That's exactly like what had happened with South Africa. No, that's, that's excellent. Um, 
And uh, I'd like you later to come back to Israel because you mentioned in the context of nuclear race, but also there are new exciting developments, uh, whether good or bad you describe it, is engagement with Israel, Israel with the Gulf, with the Abraham Accord, with your uh, country of origin relations. So things are happening there. I'd like to see how you characterize them. Uh, but I would like you, I'll leave you with a question that I'll ask you little, uh, immediately afterwards, and that is, what is your nightmare scenario in terms of Iran nuclear deal? Iran has got, has been criticized for not only its nuclear program, but its missile programs and its behavior in the neighborhood. So what, is, what, are, what are the Arab countries uh, concerned about? What is their actual plan B, or what is it that they are thinking um, that would be the nightmare that they have to prepare for? But before that, I'm going to go to uh, uh, Mr. Grossi and ask him, um, uh, basically, I'm going to be looking this way because he's on the screen. Um, essentially, um, in this conference and elsewhere, everybody um, talks uh, about the JCPOA uh, as being the number one top uh, priority issue for everybody that focus minds. Most of the people who describe it are diplomats. Uh, they are uh, obviously using diplomatic language. Either they are kind of looking at the bright side of it. Some of them are very pessimistic and thinks that it's not going well and they are uh, not uh, excited about it. But actually, we are lucky to have you, Mr. Grossi. You are, you are an insider. Um, you are in the middle of this. You can, do, you can tell us what's, uh, what you see um, and what's going on, what's the latest development. Uh, I want to refer to um, Mr. Uh, Abdullahian's uh, latest statement that he released two, three days ago. Again, he points the finger at the Americans, saying they pulled out in 2019. This was not legal. And this current administration, instead of reversing that, it continued with it. And they are uh, putting preconditions of lifting sanction first before they come back to the negotiation. But then again, they give some uh, good news, um, some uh, signal saying, no, we are prepared because, of course, they are suffering from sanctions and so on. So I want to know what's going on from the inside and how optimistic are you? It's over to you, Mr. Grossi. No, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you in this vir virtual um, uh, panel and with the Secretary General, uh, Minister. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, well, uh, like you were saying, um, the JCPOA is in everybody's minds. Um, I would remind um, that uh, JCPOA is not all that there is about uh, Iran. Um, JCPOA uh, negotiations um, are ongoing, and I will um, maybe share some thoughts about it with you in a second. Uh, but uh, it is also important to be reminded that there are, um, in parallel to that, a number of uh, things that are outstanding regarding the activities and uh, nuclear program in Iran that we have been trying and successfully so far and I hope that we'll be able to make some progress, but unsuccessfully so far to clarify with regards to the presence of, of uh, traces of uh, uranium uh, in places where, which were not uh, um, earlier uh, declared uh, by uh, Iran. Um, and uh, this is a matter that needs to be clarified because we, we have to have a level of confidence that uh, the places we are inspecting are all the places we should be inspecting. This is very important. It's still on the table. And I have been discussing about this with uh, Foreign Minister Amir Abdullahian just a few days ago in Tehran and with uh, his uh, main nuclear negotiator, Vice Minister uh, Gary Kani, yesterday here uh, in my office uh, in, in Vienna. Um, when it comes to the JCPOA negotiations, I would say um, this is ongoing as we speak uh, a few blocks from here. You, you cross the Donau River, the Danube, and you go downtown. Um, they are still uh, working and they will continue uh, to work. Um, I believe that, um, you know, on, above and beyond what uh, statements are being made, uh, we are a, a little bit, I would say, uh, um, um, 
uh, superseding uh, that um, uh, area of um, and attributing um, uh, responsibilities for where we are or for where they are. Um, they have sat down again for this seventh round of uh, discussions, which I think in itself is a good uh, indication. Um, and the process uh, is ongoing. It's, uh, it's going to be extremely complex. It is being extremely compli complex because the expectations from the different uh, actors are um, uh, different. As you know, there's no um, uh, mystery uh, about it. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Iran believes that uh, the lifting of economic sanctions should precede any um, step in the area or in the nuclear area. Um, and on the other hand, um, the Western side of the JCPOA uh, believes that uh, there should be uh, tangible progress in the nuclear uh, part, uh, with Russia and China trying to play a role of uh, uh, bridge builders uh, in between. But uh, the process is, is still uh, ongoing. Um, the other issue I would like to indicate, and it is also very relevant and potentially decisive for the success or lack thereof in the current uh, process, uh, and it relates to my last visit to, to Tehran, where I was uh, trying to get um, to an agreement, which in, in, a, in, a, in a discussion or a negotiation or a conversation, however you may want to describe it, that proved uh, inconclusive, to restore some uh, monitoring and verification capabilities that <coughs> from the, for the agency that were lost and that we haven't been able to recover. But Mr. Um, Grossi, if I, if I could intervene here, but just uh, to, I'll still give you the chance to complete. But the, the Iranian foreign minister referred to Article 26 and 36, uh, that they also abolished, or at least they activated that one, to perhaps indicating that they go back to, the, to enriching uranium and speeding up the process. Now, for you guys, there must be also a nightmare that what if you suddenly were surprised that Iran is ready to have a nuclear bomb? Uh, what would you anticipate here? Do you actually know what is going on inside Iran? The program has reached a threshold where you would be worried before everybody else. Do you, can you actually reveal some inside information to tell us, do you really know what's going on in Iran and how fast are they growing and how can they be slowed down? Well, for those who know what the IAEA is and what the IAEA does, and I think for the, for the audience it's important to remind that um, the IAEA is the only presence in Iran, international presence in Iran. So um, all that you may be reading and assessments and uh, analysts uh, speculating about this or that or 90% enrichment, all of that with all due respect, our analysis that we respect, but uh, of course, yes, we are there. We are inspecting every day of the year. We are present at all the facilities that are there and we know by the gram um, the amounts that are being enriched uh, and other activities that are taking place. That is one thing. But at the same time, what I, what I, what I was trying to say is that this uh, level of indispensable level of access is being limited has been limited by okay. two things. Okay. One is by virtue of, of course, the retaliatory measures you were mentioning, Articles 26 and 36 of the JCPOA, and the fact that Iran decided to retaliate on what they, um, uh, on, on the withdrawal from the United States, okay. uh, by suspending gradually their uh, commitments, their nuclear commitments. To the, to the JCPOA. Okay, but I'm, the other I'm, thing is I'm that going... they have unilaterally, on top of that, on top of that, they have limited some access to the agency. And this is where there is an added problem. Because if there is no clarity, complete clarity, on what is going on and the activities taking place there, 
Okay. I see it as less uh, possible that an agreement uh, of any nature could be reached, and this is what I have been discussing with our. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you uh, for more. Uh, I'll leave you with a question. You think about and formulate the answer. Uh, we are talking. This session is all about, and not just MENA, but the Gulf as well as the uh, Middle East as a whole. Most people feel left out. They think they are not party, or at least not big uh, at the table in discussions about the nuclear deal. They do not. They cannot influence the uh, the ultimate deal. Uh, so their concern is genuine. Their reaction could be uh, very um, unwanted or negative. So um, there must be a way of uh, you guys and your organization or the global partners engaging the, uh, the, the Gulf as well as you know, the entire Middle East guys to listen to them, to reassure them, to see uh, how they can be reassured and they be prevented from themselves investing in nuclear programs in the future in, uh, in return. So I'll leave you with that to see how you can help them, reassure them, but also engage them. But I'm going to turn back to you, uh, Your Excellency. Um, so I, I asked you about your nightmare scenario and what is it that uh, you guys can do to help um, at least be part, a big part of decision making and make them listen to you? The, the, you see, the dangers of, of the current situation, I think, are twofold. One, the Iranians reaching or uh, having a breakthrough towards a nuclear weapon. That will create tensions beyond the region. That is one. The second issue is Iran being aborted by an attack because an attack would again harm the whole region because it would create certain tensions within that certain forces within the region, the Iranians themselves will react. So the best option from my point of view is to renew GCPOA to reach a certain conclusion there, to have, uh, to, to, to have the patience to work for a settlement. And I would advise, strongly advise the Iranians to moderate their positions vis-a-vis -vis the region as well as vis-a-vis -vis that nuclear issue. The region is subject to a number of pressures that are creating tensions beyond the comprehension of anybody. Uh, it is already subject to what had happened over the last 10 years. Someone today was calling it spring. It was, for the region, a disaster. So the advice is to keep working for a settlement, for settling that issue. Don't ever forget that you have certain strong players within the region that would find that the least to say, the least to say uh, negative if the Arab world is subject to two pressures one from an Israeli nuclear weapon and one from an Iranian nuclear weapon, squeezing the, re the region in between. But you I have also get, Turkey. I want you to get to the nightmare scenario because that is you're, the, you're, a the good diplomat, the, you're a good diplomat. No, 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 no. I, 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 I told you. Imagine there would be an attack, an attack that would, would uh, endanger the Hormuz passage would uh, endanger the Babel Mandab uh, passage as I 
as I stated earlier in my opening remarks, as well as the Suez Canal. No one wants war again in the Middle East. The Middle East is subject to, again, that, uh, that session we attended refugees and immigrants. Millions of people from within the region are compelled to leave their countries. We do not want this. Okay, Anymore. well, the, the, there is, short of that major catastrophe, there is some other uh, kind of scenarios that people describe as nightmares. First of all, I mentioned that Iran has got a nuclear program, has missiles, has uh, the, its behavior in the region. Uh, there are many weak uh, states in the region. There are some failed states in the region. To reverse the trend, it's going to become very difficult without dealing with Iran first, dealing with uh, Israel first, dealing with everyone. And when you see that the United States that was in a position of leadership is focused more on the JCPOA and JCPOA is detached from the other issues to do with Iran. So that means carry on, continuation, whether Iran becomes nuclear or not, the behavior, the dynamics, the balance of power in the region, the order will still be in such a turmoil. And uh, in your organization, uh, you know better than everybody else, there are many conflicts in the region that are really um, uh, difficult to tackle. So that is a nightmare scenario where can actually the Arab world, uh, let's call it, because we don't like, you and I don't like the word Arab countries or Arab state, but Arab world as, as being this entire area, can they take matters into their hands and provide some leadership and, and deal with Iran there's some of them are negotiating, but actually the negotiation is to prevent attack rather than deal with the root cause. Can they deal with it themselves uh, without is, the United States? You see, you see, that is the crux of the matter. Because there are those within the Arab world who are calling for engage the Iranians and directly speak to them. The issue is the lack of trust. And that issue of trust uh, emanates from the behavior. The Iranian state is behaving over the last 40 years in a manner that is threatening the stability of certain Arab countries. And I do not want to repeat what had been said so long over the last four or five years that some Iranian officials are claiming to have control over the decision in four Arab capitals. So how to create that kind of trust, confidence in the behavior, to allow opening of discussions? That is not existent right now. It is not. As well as even those outside forces, the great powers who are making, uh, uh, putting plans or proposals while they are quarreling with each other in other areas. The atmosphere globally, the atmosphere globally is not conducive to uh, discussions. The only opening, I think, is the renewal of the agreement okay. that would give us a kind of a spare time, 15 years, to reflect and to build that structure of cooperation as required by the title of well, our panel. Thank you. I, I'm, it's very clear. I'm glad that you're uh, focused on making this work uh, uh, for the time being, at least. I'm going to leave you with a question before I go to Mr. Grossi. But the question again. It is obvious that you are interested in questions all the time. No, no, I'm listening as well. Um, okay. But uh, I want you to be direct in answering them rather than answering your own question. So essentially, Israel uh, is, is not a left in the room. It's all, is now uh, an open uh, discussion. They have managed successfully through Bram uh, Accord to engage uh, different Arab countries, different Gulf countries, and they are uh, going deeper in terms of having investment, socio-political uh, engagement. They are even going down to level of people to people. 
Now, your country of origin had long relations with Israel, but never really d went down to people to people. It was more like security as well as Jordan. So, but this is like a time things are changing, and this current U.S. administration is continuing with this and supportive. Your, your task is difficult because you and I in the generation... That is, that is the wrong reading of I'd the like situation. I'd like you to correct that for I me when, when I give you the chance to, but I want to leave you with this issue of what is your uh, general feel about Israeli engagement with the different Arab countries while others are opposing it. I go back to Mr. Grossi. I hope you remember the question. I'm not going to repeat it, but just one word in the word that how can you help and engage the um, people in the area to reassure them and make them feel ownership of the process? Well, I think the only logical way is to talk to them and to come to them. And this is exactly what I'm doing. Um, uh, it is um, obvious uh, that there is a great anxiety all over the world, but in particular in the region, uh, as um, Minister Gates was just saying very rightly, uh, because of the reverberations and the repercussions of whatever may happen uh, in Iran will go far beyond uh, the, the limits of the Middle East, however you describe it. Um, and uh, it is in interesting to note in this regard that the whole approach to nuclear um, uh, in, in the region um, is, is changing uh, uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, why? Because uh, you have, um, for example, the United Arab Emirates, uh, where I will be uh, very soon, uh, that is today is a nuclear um, energy producing country. It's a country that has four nuclear power reactors. Um, Egypt, where I am also going to be in a few days, uh, is a country that very soon will have also three or four nuclear power reactors. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, a country that has had uh, political statements, quite clear political statements, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the potential um, degradation of the situation um, in Iran and the possibility of nuclear weapons being developed there, is also a country that uh, is actively considering a nuclear power program, which means uh, a lot of nuclear material in the area, since it, sensitive installations there that are going to be inspected by the IEA. So uh, there is an added dimension here which um, involves not only the geostrategic dimension, which is quite obvious and has been there for a long time for all these countries, but also now a different one in the sense that they become uh, nuclear power, nuclear power, nuclear power players in their own right which means a completely different approach to nuclear um, diplomacy writ large. So uh, it requires from uh, me as Director General uh, an, uh, an ever closer um, relationship and dialogue uh, with them. Hence, and this is a um, coincidence, but not so much, the fact, as I am mentioning to you, that in very few days I will be in Cairo, in very few days I will be at the Emirates, um, in the next few months, I will be in Saudi Arabia. So there is also, in the part of all these countries, um, a um, demand for uh, a closer relationship with IEA in terms of us, like you were saying, um, involving them, uh, letting them know what is happening, um, making them feel part of the situation, because at the end of the day, whatever may happen will have uh, quite obviously, uh, very clear uh, consequences for all of these countries. So the IAEA, what you will see in the next few months and years, is an IAEA that will be deployed in a much, um, uh, I would say, intensive way in the whole uh, area. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I very much hope this happens, because last time your agency and the global powers were heavily criticized for uh, not doing just that. Now, I'm going to give you a lion's share of the, the time to address all the questions. Uh, let's start with Israel. I have got another question, because that's my job, as, by the way, to ask you questions. Uh, on the Israeli one, give me your comment. I tell you, General, uh, General John Allen today, and another panel, said, strongly stated, that 
the Abraham Accords saved the situation in the region because the Israelis had all the intentions under Netanyahu to annex the occupied territories. So the Accords stopped that from happening. That is one aspect of the story. But the more important aspect of the story is that we still have the Palestinian question unsettled and the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis preceded us half an hour ago. The Palestinian foreign minister say, stating that the problem continues. So the accords didn't help in settling the Palestinian. It settled only certain aspects of the relations between Israel and some Arab countries. It didn't introduce a dramatic change in the situation. The situation still remains as is an Israeli occupation, settlement activity, usurpation of territory, and hopefully, hopefully, we would defend the concept of the two states because in the absence of the two states uh, settlement or solution, there will be uh, an area between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, Israel, Palestine, settled by currently, currently 14 to 15 million people. In 2050, in 2050, they will not be 15, they will be 22 million, 12 Palestinians, 12 million Palestinians, and only eight Israelis. And then it will be an apartheid state, and the world, I do not expect the world accepting anymore the apartheid regime. So it will be one state, and we have then to give the so-called democratic values of the Western world, meaning each citizen has the right to select his own prime minister and his own foreign minister, and maybe then the Israelis would recognize how wrong they were 10, 15 years earlier. That's, that's great. So I hear that you are obviously mindful of the, ongoing, the, the root causes or the historic problems, but also encouraged by the, the new um, developments and the accords and so on. Now, uh, as a Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, all these member countries, they had problems, they had conflicts that, that maybe your league uh, could not really solve or help or coordinate or at least uh, uh, crack barriers until member states themselves uh, decided they are ready. Now, we, have, we are witnessing new, new movements, new negotiations. I think the United Arab Emirates is leading the way in cracking a lot of barriers. They started engaging, uh, obviously, collectively with, uh, under the Al Ula uh, Accord or agreement uh, earlier this year in January. They all decided to reconcile with Qatar and lift all the uh, blockades on it. Uh, they are reaching out to Turkey. They are reaching out to uh, all, uh, even uh, Bashar's regime, I understand. They are reaching out for all the, to all the uh, classical uh, foes whom they had problems with over the years. But equally, they are engaging Iran, and Saudi Arabia is doing something similar. So there are movements. There are negotiations. But we don't know if that translates into alignments, translates into security architecture, security alignment. Is this actually designed to be adding to resilience against Iran or in the face of Iran? Uh, or is this actually, uh, it will have economic depth, it will have more like a, a greater uh, 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 leadership towards reconstructing, rebuilding this whole area. So you, you tell us where you stand, what you encourage, but also what you understand from it, not just as an analyst, uh, because that's really, your, your job is being policy maker and influencing policies in these countries. You see, Dr. Delauer, it is, from my point of view, a kind of a probing, probing 
measures, steps, opening up to different partners, aiming at possibly understanding their positions and creating some trust, as I told you. Maybe that trust and confidence would, would bring in a change of, uh, of course. The, the Iranians, you see, neighbors of the Arab world have been taking advantage of what had happened over the last 10 years. And taking advantage, and you come from Kurdistan, and you understand fully what I am aiming at. They are encroaching on Arab territory, and Arab, on Arab states' territory, on the Arab world. So the probe now is, is there a way to find, uh, to find settlements and resolutions for our differences? Why are you encroaching on our territory? Is it in defense of your own interest? How do you characterize your interests? What is your interest, Turkey or Iran? So these probes, I think, might help or might prove a point that we need further to build trust. That is the way I see it. Okay, um, Mr. Grossi, I'll give you the last couple of minutes to give us your thoughts, uh, advice. You were a foreign minister of an important country, you're a diplomat, you're an expert on the Middle East. Uh, tell us what you see and, and what would be your word of advice to, before we conclude. Uh, very simple. Uh, I think that when it comes to, to the JCPOA, um, uh, time, uh, the, the clock is ticking, there's not much time. Uh, the situation uh, as, as is will not be prolonged for too long. Um, Iran uh, is moving ahead with this nuclear program. As I told the foreign minister, that is all fine, but this needs to be inspected. And they should not be limiting the access of the international inspectors. At the same time, JCPOA, uh, if the parties to the agreement so wish, um, uh, is something that can be restored. The IAEA is ready to, to play its part. Um, my impression is that time is running and there is not much of it. So uh, the, on the last issue you mentioned, time is running. Uh, is this actually what everybody else shares in Vienna? Do they really play time or kick the can down the road or are they actually feeling the sense of urgency and to get on with it before it's too late? Well, uh, it's a good question for them. What I can tell you, my opinion is based on what I inspect and what I see. And what I see is that uh, in Iran, we are seeing enrichment at 60%. This is unprecedented. This has never happened in a, in a non-nuclear weapon state. This is tantalizingly close to weapon grade level. So it's not to be banalized. So we need to uh, stabilize the situation. Without the JCPOA, and I would, um, uh, God, uh, you know, I would join um, Secretary General in his assessment that JCPOA may not be perhaps the ideal situation, but it will provide a degree of uh, predictability. It, provi it will provide a degree of um, uh, stability. At the moment, we are lacking this. And as I said in the beginning, uh, there are also additional layers of uncertainty there. So I, I hope that uh, our Iranian counterparts will engage with, with me in the beginning, and uh, uh, for starters more than they are doing that, uh, than they are doing at, at the moment. Um, I think that is not impossible. It is actually uh, a necessity. Uh, I, I would even say uh, starting for them. Uh, and then we will see. Uh, I think okay. at the moment there is neither optimism nor pessimism. Pessimism, there is concern. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll give you the last word with the last minute. What is the question? <laughs> Very good one, formulate one. Uh, last words for this audience. None? Last words, conclusion, something like that. If I would uh, say in this forum one word, I would advise 
the Western world to be careful not to intervene the way they intervened over the last 10 years in affairs of the Arab world because it led to many, many, many disasters. Thank you. Word of wisdom. Thank you very much. The organizers, the audience, and those who stayed awake and attended, uh, and of course, uh, the speakers uh, who shared their thoughts and their ideas, and they were generous with us. So thank you in the usual way. Thank you, Dr. Polaya.